Hi everybody, welcome and thanks for joining us today for our webinar, which is going to be looking at related party transactions and the 2023 annual information statement. My name is Gabby and I'm from the ACNC's education team and joining me today is Joe, who's from our reporting and red tape reduction team. Hi Joe, thanks for joining us today. How are you doing? Hey Gabby, I'm good, thank you. Thanks Joe. So, First, to start off, I'd just like to acknowledge the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to the land, sea and community. I pay my respects to them and their cultures and elders, past and present. Today, this webinar is being presented from Wurundjeri land. Now, before we begin, just a couple of quick housekeeping points as usual. So if you do experience any difficulty with the webinar audio, you can try listening in through your phone. There'll be a number that you can call listed in the email that you received when you signed up to attend today's webinar. There'll be an access code in there and you can listen in through your phone. Now we've got some of our colleagues, Chris, John and Eric, who will be assisting us with this presentation today. They'll be answering some questions as they come through in the background. So feel free to send through your questions through the GoToWebinar interface at any time throughout the webinar. Um, we'll try to answer as many of those questions as possible, but if we don't get to yours or if you think of something a bit later on, you can always send us an email at education at acnz.gov.au and we'll be able to get back to you. Now, we will be recording this webinar today, so you'll be able to watch it later on and you can read through those presentation slides. Uh, we'll send you all out an email to everyone who's registered with all of those links. And finally, we'd always love to get some feedback from you. So we've got a quick survey at the end of the webinar today. It'll be super quick, about 30 seconds to complete. So we'd really appreciate it if you can fill that out right at the end. Okay, so now that we've covered those few admin points, um, let's move on to the agenda for today. So our main focus is on related party transactions. So we'll start by explaining who is a related party and what a related party transaction is. We're also going to have a look at how the requirement to disclose related party transactions came about. And then we'll discuss the specific requirements that charities need to answer in their 2023 annual information statement, or the AIS as we sometimes call it. Uh, we'll also touch on a few other changes to this year's AIS, as well as some common reporting mistakes that charities can make. Okay, so let's get started. Joe, are you able to give us some insights into what a related party is? Absolutely. A related party is someone who's connected to a charity and who could influence the charity. So if a small charity is that charity with an annual revenue under $500,000, focuses around what we call significant influence. For medium and um, large size charities, that's charities with a revenue over $500,000, the definition of a related party is based on the existing definition within the Australian Accounting Standards or AASP, as it's often abbreviated. There are some additional considerations such as control or joint control, and we won't go into all the specifics here, but you can find out more details about related parties and the definitions based on charity size on the ACNC website, as well as the AASB website. Generally, a related party could be someone with direct involvement with the charity, such as a responsible person, so that's the board or committee member or senior management, such as the CEO. The close family members of these people can also be a related party. A related party could also refer to another organization that has significant influence over the charity's decision making. And if a related party of one charity also controls or has significant influence over another organization, then that organization could be a related party. Great. And how about other employees or volunteers? Are they and their families also considered related parties? No. And that's an important point to note. Simply being involved with the charity doesn't make someone a related party. We need to consider whether the person or that organization has significant influence over the, over the charity's strategic and uh, financial decisions. Great. So now that we know a little bit more about what a related party is, can you tell us what is a related party transaction? A related party transaction is really any transfer of uh, 
resources, services, or obligations between a charity and a related party. So let's go through an example. Maybe a charity is looking to buy a vehicle to deliver meals to people in need, and a board member's brother has a vehicle he wants to sell. If the charity bought the vehicle from the board member's brother, that would be a related party transaction. The brother is a close family member, therefore a related party, and the sale of the vehicle would be the transfer of resources, so a transaction has taken place. That's a great example. Thanks, Joe. Um, and it also highlights a good point that related party transactions can be really beneficial to charities. Uh, so in this case, um, the brother may be happy to give the charity a discount on that purchase. Uh, so related party transactions aren't necessarily a problem, but it does mean that the charity needs to know how to effectively manage related party transactions. Uh, and charities also need to be aware of conflicts of interest and how to safeguard charitable assets from the risk of private benefit. Exactly, Gabby. And there are some things charities can do to make sure these type of transactions are responsibly managed. That would include maintaining a register of related party transactions, having appropriate policies and procedures to ensure decisions are always being made in the best interest of the charity and not the related party. And lastly, just having processes in place to manage conflicts of interest. Excellent. So in this example, um, the board member should identify that they do have a conflict of interest since their brother is involved, and they should then notify the rest of the board straight away. So the conflict should be recorded and the charity's conflict of interest policy should be followed. So this may require the board member to excuse themselves when a decision is being made about the purchase of the car. Now, to ensure that the purchase is being made in the charity's best interest, the board needs to conduct due diligence. Uh, so this could involve seeking quotes for other similar vehicles to check if they are paying a fair price. Uh, so if the charity does go ahead with the purchase of the board member's brother's car, all of the details need to be recorded in the Register of Related Party Transactions. That's right, Gabby. And if you'd like some more information about how to manage related party transactions, you can always find more details and resources on our website at acnc.gov.au forward slash rpt. And I'd also just like to clarify a related party transaction doesn't necessarily need to involve a financial payment. So, for example, a charity runs a paid program and the child of the CEO can attend for free. This still falls under the definition of a related party transaction because, well, the child is a related party and the program is a service provided by the charity. That's a really great point. So we're not exclusively talking about financial transactions. Now, before we get into the specific questions about related parties in the annual information statement, could you give us a brief explanation of why charities are being asked to provide this information about related parties? Yes. And that's a good question because some charities have asked us why they need to be reporting this information to us. Back in 2018, the government established an independent review panel to carry out a review of the ECNC legislation. And one of the requirements was to require charities to disclose related party transactions. This requirement is consistent with other overseas charity regulators who require charities to report the same related party transactions. Disclosing this information would help to build public trust and confidence as the public can now see how the charity's assets are being used. That's right. So it's a great way for charities to be able to demonstrate transparency. Now, can you walk us through how charities actually disclose this information to the ACNC? Um, so what questions do people need to complete in their annual information statement? Sure, Gabby. So the first thing charities will be asked is, did your charity have any reportable related party transactions in the 2023 reporting period? So that's just a yes or no answer. Sure. And what makes a related party transaction reportable? Right. Uh, an example of reportable related party transaction could be if a charity is paying money in exchange for a related party to supply goods or provide services to the charity. This can be pretty common in the sector. And there are some other examples. So for example, you can include if a charity is giving a loan or transferring its property to a related party or paying a salary to a related party's relative. 
Now, this isn't an exhaustive list. It's just uh, a few examples. Of course. Um, and how about non-reportable transactions? Could you give us a few examples of those? Sure. Some things that wouldn't be considered reportable include a gift of a box of chocolates to a charity's board members, just to say thank you for their pro bono service, or a related party buying goods from the charity on the same terms offered to the rest of the public. Volunteer services provided by a related party that are the same as services provided by the charity's other volunteers does typically not result in a reportable related party transaction. We also generally don't consider donations received from a related party to be a reportable related party transaction, which requires disclosure within the AIS. Okay, thanks, Joe. So now if people are still a bit unsure about whether something is reportable or not, uh, you can find some more examples in our web guidance about related party transactions. That's right, Gabby, but please keep in mind that while examples are provided on the website, at the end of the day, it's up to the charity and their advisors like accountants or auditors to determine if there's sufficient interest in these transactions from the stakeholders to make them reportable. Medium and large charities must determine if it is a material transaction when preparing their annual financial report and make sure it's disclosed if it is material. Okay, that makes sense. Uh, so if a charity does have reportable related party transactions, what information do they need to provide? Sure, so if you didn't have any, you can just answer no and that's that. And you can move into the next section of the AIS. But if your charity had a reportable related party transaction during the reporting period, then answer yes, and the charity would need to select the relevant related party transactions from the list that you can see up on your slide. The last option for other is just in case your charity's transaction doesn't fit into the categories, you can type in the type of transaction. If the charity chooses, it can provide any other relevant details. So for example, if you're submitting a financial report, which is needed for medium and large charities, you may just enter the page number on which the related party transactions are disclosed. Okay, great. Um, and you've just mentioned the financial report. So what do people need to include in there? Sure, so for medium and large size charities, they need to provide details of related party transactions in their financial statements in accordance with the requirements of AASB 124 or 160. And this applies whether the charity prepares special purpose financial statements or general purpose financial statements. Some more of the technical details are available on our website and charities can also talk to their accountant, their reviewer or auditor for more information. More guidance is also available on the AASB website. Perfect. And in order to provide transparency to the public, um, the financial report, as well as the charity's details and its programs and financial information from the AIS, uh, it will be made available on the ACNC Charity Register, which members of the public will be able to view. Yes, that's correct, Gabby. Now, there may be situations where a charity has been approved to have some or all of its information withheld from the register. So this could be, for example, if there was a public safety issue or the information is commercially sensitive. Aside from those cases, this information will be available as part of the AIS on the register. Okay, and just before we move on to some more general guidance and tips about completing the annual information statement, uh, we do just have some resources to help charities with meeting their obligations to report related party transactions. Uh, so you can see those up on your screen at the moment. Uh, we've got a template that charities can use. Um, so this helps to keep track of related party transactions. So you're able to download that um, from our website. There'll be a link to it on our related party transactions webpage. That's right, Gabby. You'll be able to record the uh, related party name, the nature of the relationship, the description of the transaction, the amount, the dates, and the uh, relevant approval details. A couple of examples are already provided in the template just to guide charities. All charities are welcome to use this template if they feel it is appropriate to their circumstances, especially the smaller ones that may have limited resources. As always, for more details about the different aspects of related party transactions that we have covered today, 
It's available at acnc.gov.au forward slash RPT. While you're, on your web, while you're on our website, you can also have a look at our 2023 AIS guide, which has details about completing your AIS. And you can find that at acnc.gov.au forward slash 2023 AIS guide. Lastly, charities can always email our reporting inbox at reporting at acnc.gov.au if they have any questions about related party transactions. For other general questions, including for help submitting the 2023 AIS, you can submit a general inquiry in the charity portal or from our Contact Us page. <clears throat> Excellent. Um, and speaking of the annual information statement a bit more generally, uh, many charities will be due to submit their AIS um, pretty soon. So if you're reporting for a standard financial year, so from the 1st of July 2022 to the 30th of June 2023, your annual information statement will be due by the 31st of January 2024, so start of next year. Um, it's a really great idea to get your AIS submitted sooner rather than later. So if you can try to submit it this year, um, that's a great idea. That way, if you do need a little bit of extra help or advice about completing the annual information statement, you've got a bit of time to contact the ACNC for help. Um, it does also give you some time to reach out to your accountant or to other people who work with the charity if you do need any additional information from them. Uh, now, for those of you who are operating on a calendar year, your reporting for 2023 hasn't ended yet. Uh, so your 2023 AIS will be due by 30th of June 2024, so the middle of next year, and you'll have access to complete it in the charity portal from early next year. Now, in preparation of those charities who are about to submit their 2023 annual information statement, there are a few things um, that people should just be aware of. Joe, do you want to run us through those? Sure, Gabby. So the first thing I want to remind people of is the reporting thresholds. Small charities with an annual revenue under $500,000 need to submit their AIS, including the related party transactions questions. It's not mandatory to also submit a financial report, but small charities can choose to submit one if they want to. Medium and large charities need to submit both the AIS and a financial report. Medium charities have a revenue of of $500,000 or above, but under $3 million. They can have the financial report either reviewed or audited. Large charities with revenue of $3 million or more need to get their financial report audited before it's submitted to us. Now there's also basic religious charities. If your charity meets the specific criteria to report as a basic religious charity, the charity still needs to submit an AIS but the financial questions are optional, so you won't need to report related party transactions. Great, thanks, Joe. Um, and aside from related party transactions, are there any other changes that we'll see this year? Yes, there are a couple of new things this year. We've introduced a new version of program classifications. Each charity needs to provide the details of at least one charity program, which is an activity or service that a charity runs to pursue its charitable purpose for its beneficiaries. It may be small or large, ongoing or temporary, but it's something the charity does to achieve its goal. Yeah, so what you'll need to do is choose a classification for each of your charity's programs. So if you are adding a new program this year, or if you're just reviewing the details from a program you've already, um, already listed in a previous year, just make sure you check the classification to ensure that it matches. Exactly. Another, another update is that you'll need to provide an email address if you add a new responsible person, so that's a board or committee member or a trustee. <clears throat> this should be the person's own email address, not a generic charity email. Once they've been listed as a responsible person, they can sign up to the charity portal with that same email address. Great, thanks Joe. Um, so those were a few sort of new things to note. How about common mistakes that you see? Are there any um, problems that you regularly see charities having when they complete their annual information statement? So currently the reporting team is reviewing a sample of annual information statements and financial reports from last year. And there are some common errors that we've noticed. 
we often see the financial statement type selection is incorrect. And time and again, we come across charities that list the incorrect type of financial statement in their AIS. So when you complete your AIS, medium and large charities will be asked about the type of financial report they're providing, either a general purpose or a special purpose financial report. You need to know which option to select, to select in the AIS. So it's important to double check what's written in your financial report. And typically this will be stated um, in note one after the financial statements. And you can always check with your accountant or auditor if you're unsure. Another issue we see is material differences in some of the figures in the AIS in comparison to the financial report. This could just simply be as a result of a typo. For example, if a zero is mistakenly left off, it can change your charity's revenue from say a million dollars to a hundred thousand dollars. And that makes a big difference and it could cause issues with your charity's reporting with the incorrect charity size. Before you submit your AIS, please make sure you read through all of the information, and compare it to your financial report and other records, just to double check the information is accurate. Thanks, Joan. That's a really important point because donors and members of the public really rely on the information that's published on the charity register. So charities should really take care to ensure that all of that information is accurate. Now, if you do notice that you've made a mistake when you submit your annual information statement, you can amend it in the charity portal. So if you do notice any little errors, just make sure you fix those up. Um, and another thing I just wanted to mention while we're talking about the annual information statement is that it is the responsibility of all responsible people to be completing and submitting accurate information about the charity's finances and operations. So while some charities may have their treasurer or maybe their accountant completing the AIS, um, you should really consider it to be a team effort to complete the annual information statement both accurately and on time. Uh, so we have some resources available on our website that your charity will be able to use. Um, so that includes a checklist of all of the information you'll need to complete your AIS. So it might be a good idea just to have a look through this um, together so everyone on the board or committee knows what information needs to be provided when you submit your AIS. Okay, so I think that is going to bring us to the end of our main presentation for today. Um, but we do have some time to answer a few questions from our audience. Now, a few people asked us to talk about key management personnel remuneration when they registered for today's webinar. So I think we'll start there. Joe, are you able to give us just a brief overview of what key management personnel remuneration is? Yes, Gabby, and this is a really important topic to discuss because we've noticed charities having trouble with it. Key management personnel, or KMP as it's often abbreviated, are the senior decision makers in a charity. So that includes responsible people and other senior staff like the CEO. It doesn't include team leaders or operational managers. Remuneration refers to all forms of consideration provided by the charity in exchange for services rendered to the charity. That covers things like wages or salaries paid, fringe benefits and termination benefits. Great. And what exactly do charities need to be reporting? Small charities don't need to submit an annual financial report, so there's no requirement for them to report KMP. Medium and uh, medium charities preparing special purpose financial statements also aren't required to report key management personnel remuneration. Medium charities preparing general purpose financial reports only need to report this information in their financial reports. However, all large charities need to report this information in their financial report, but also in the annual information statement. In the AIS, large charities will be asked if your charity has more than one remunerated KMP. If the answer is yes, the charity needs to provide the number of KMP and the total remuneration paid. For ACNC reporting, KMP remuneration is separate from related party transactions. The requirement to report related party transactions applies to charities of all sizes, while reporting KMP remuneration is mandatory only for the large charities, 
and medium charities preparing general purpose financial reports. Thanks, Joe. So that was just um, a bit of an overview, but if anyone is looking for a bit more detail, you can read our web guidance at acnc.gov.au forward slash KMP. Um, and now, as you mentioned before, it is really important to make sure that this information matches both in the annual information statement and in your financial report. Yes, Gabby, good point. This is another common error, AIS error that we've seen where the key management personnel remuneration wasn't consistently reported in the AIS and the annual financial report. Okay, thanks, Joe. So I think we've got time for one more question from our audience today. Uh, so this one brings us back to our main topic of related party transactions. So if a board member does incur some out-of-pocket expenses and then they are reimbursed by the charity, would this be considered a related party transaction? Yes. So in this case, there is a transfer of resources being money from the charity to the board member who is the related party. Therefore, it would qualify as a related party transaction. Now, whether the transaction would be considered reportable depends on if the transaction poses any risks or threats to the charity's assets for private benefit. If it's a reasonable re reimbursement for charity related expenses that the board member has paid out of pocket, I would say generally it isn't considered reportable. Thanks, Joe. Um, and as we mentioned earlier, you can find a bit more information and some more examples on our website. So it's acnc.gov.au forward slash RPT. Um, so I think that will be our last question for today. Um, so you can see some of those resources up on our screen for the moment if you do need some more information. Um, but that's going to be our last question for today's presentation. And um, so I do just want to thank all of our colleagues for helping out with answering questions. Um, so Chris and John and Eric for answering all of those behind the scenes. Um, hopefully they got to your question. If not, um, you can see the email up on your screen um, or you can shoot us through an email at education at acnc.gov.au. Uh, now we also have recorded today's webinar so it will be available online soon and we'll send a link out to everyone who's registered um, so you'll be able to access it. We'll also share with you the slides and these key resources just if you need any more information. Now, we've got a few ways that you can stay in touch with us, which you'll be able to see up on your screen at the moment. Um, obviously, we've got our website, which has got loads of resources, as well as all of our past webinars and podcasts. Um, and you can also find some information about how to get in contact with us. Now, you can also follow us on social media and you can sign up to our monthly newsletter, The Charitable Purpose. So that includes all of our latest news and resources. And that's also where we'll be promoting any upcoming webinars. Now, just before we wrap up, um, we'd really love to hear your feedback. Um, so there will be a really short survey just at the end of the webinar. So there'll only be a couple of questions. So if you've got 30 seconds to stay online, we'd really appreciate it if you just fill that out and gave us a little bit of your thoughts. Okay, so I think that brings us to the end for today. Thank you, Joe, for joining us to talk about related party transactions. Thank you, Gabby. It was great to be here. Thanks again. Okay, have a great day, everybody, and we will see you at the next webinar.